want to ask you in joining me by putting your hands right over your heart. Now let's pray together this morning. Father, we come before the, the throne of grace in a time of need to find help. Lord, we thank you that you invite us to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. We're grateful, Lord, that we get to run to you today and every day, for that matter, for every day. Now, Lord, today as we talk about just the most serious and heartbreaking, personal, problematic issues, Lord, as we this morning have to grapple with a subject, God, that we wish we could always just put a tidy bow on and make it all better. Doesn't work that way always. Holy Spirit, come. Be our teacher. Be our guide. And help us this morning. Teach us this morning. Heal us this morning. Give us hope this morning. We believe you for that, Lord. Because you're good. In Jesus' name. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, be seated. <clears throat> George Barna is a world-renowned pollster. If you want to know a statistic, if you want to know a stat on something, George Barna has your answer. He has interviewed and asked questions of who knows how many people throughout the decades, and he's got answers about everything that people are thinking and feeling. The number one undisputed question that people have about God is this. Why does God allow tragedy and suffering? It's the number one question that people have about God. There's a bunch of offshoots of that, right? It would be like, if God's a loving God, you're telling me that God loves me and God's a good God and you know all those types of things. It, it, it has a lot of different faces, but basically it boils down to this. Why does God allow tragedy and suffering? We're gonna get to unpacking some answers to that this morning in just a few minutes, but there's some things I need to say first. I'm taking all the pressure off of myself to answer all of your questions perfectly so that you never have to struggle with this issue. I'm telling you right now, if you find the answer that satisfies everybody to this completely, write a book. <laughs> what I am going to do this morning is open up not just the Word of God, but I believe the heart of God so that we can look in 
get as much help and hope and healing that we possibly can this side of heaven so that we can live our lives not devastated by the stuff that is going to come our way, and it is. It's been said by many people throughout the centuries, if you haven't yet endured suffering, you will. You will. We've gotta know how to answer this question for ourselves and for people that we come in contact with because it's the number one question that people ask. Why does God allow tragedy and suffering? You might be wondering what all this is about this morning. I'm gonna tell you. There's been a tragedy recently that has touched our church family that is beyond heartbreaking. Six days ago, a mother down in Columbia took the lives of her four adopted teenage children. Bo, Megan, Leah and Kaylee, and then she took her own life. It's been all over the news. I trust you've heard about it. She left behind three biological adult children and two grandchildren. Cindy's only 55 years old. Over the years, this family has sporadically attended Grace Chapel, but more recently, the four adopted children were regular, vital, loved participants in both our middle school ministry and our high school ministry. And so this tragedy that you've seen on the news has touched our church family. This is our third tragedy in as, in as many months. Been a pretty rough go lately. Our response to this tragedy is that we've offered pastoral care for the surviving adult children, Sarah and I, rest of the church staff getting involved as this unfolds. We've offered pastoral care to them Yesterday, we brought in two uh, experts in the area of trauma and PTSD to how many people did we have there, Mark? About 70. About 70 of our staff and elders and youth ministry volunteers spent five or six hours, whatever it was, with these experts in the fields of trauma and PTSD so that our staff and elders and leaders and volunteers know how to best minister to our kids in the youth group as well as people who are dealing with suffering and tragedy all on their own. We've got ideas for future events to equip and heal hurting, suffering, grieving people. And so this has been a tender and yet aggressive response to this because the church has to step in. Now, before we get into the message this morning, I wanna just give one final word of caution. I'm gonna ask you to guard your heart against uninformed conclusions. Because as much as you might be tempted to say, how could anybody? I assure you, you don't know the whole story. 
So I would encourage you to guard your heart. I know we live in a world today that loves to give opinions about things they know nothing about. Hold off from the temptation and be a Christian for just a minute. So today, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about processing our suffering. This isn't just about this event. This is about maybe things that have already happened to you or something that's going to come your way. But I want to talk to you about processing our suffering because nobody escapes suffering this side of the veil. We have to learn how to deal with suffering. We have to then learn how to process it so that then healing can happen. Now this today is gonna be everything from philosophical to biblical to personal. It's gonna run the gamut and I'm gonna do the best I can in the next few minutes to try to at least lay some foundation for us to be able to process some of our suffering. I think the first question that we need to ask ourselves and then answer is where did tragedy and suffering even come from? <laughs> where did it start? How did it start? The biblical answer to this is that when Adam and Eve freely chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, something happened then that changed mankind forever. Sin and death entered into our world. What we call the curse or the fall of mankind and all of creation entered into our reality, just like God said it would. So tragedy and suffering entered mankind's life through our own rebellion and disobedience to God. God's idea for mankind was the beauty of, of the Garden of Eden. We forfeited that when we disobeyed and partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's where this whole thing started from. Now, this is an unrealized fact, but it's interesting to me. The fact that people even recognize good and evil goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Most of us don't even think about that. So when's the last time somebody asked you, hey, why do you think you even recognize good and evil? No, but we just, well, we're, well, we're human or we're intelligent or whatever. But like, where did that even come from? Where did the knowledge between understanding good and evil, where did that even enter into our minds? It goes all the way back into the garden. It's in our very DNA. As fallen as it is, it's in our very DNA to understand the difference between good and evil. The fact that we love and long for what is good and ache over that which is wrong and produces suffering, it's proof, listen to me, it is proof of our creator's existence and our own longing to return to that which we experienced in the Garden of Eden. When we discern between right and wrong, when we go, God, that's wrong and broken and heartbreaking. You, you think you've just come up with that on your own? You understand that because Originally, we knew only the beauty of God and his creation, and we partook of the tree of the knowledge, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now we know the difference. And now when something tragic and sad and heartbreaking happens, it hits that part of our eternal DNA that says, I don't think we were made for this originally. I don't think this was God's original design. Rape and murder and cancer and hurricanes. Tornadoes and addiction and, I mean, go on down the list. 
There's something in us that says we weren't meant for this. Beloved, suffering, it doesn't disprove God. It affirms his reality and validates his word. Secondly, if tragedy and suffering is the result of God giving man free will, the ability to make choices, why did God give man free will then? See, we want to we wanna go down these, these roads to try to find out how we can live a pain-free life. So where did this all come from? Well, here's where it came from. Well, then why did God give free will? Wouldn't it have been better if he didn't give us free will and just created us as robots who were programmed to always and only do the right thing that would never produce pain and suffering? You think about that. God creates perfectly programmed robots who never do anything wrong, who don't have the ability to choose what is loving and is right. If God creates us without free will, there is no such thing as genuine love. If God created us in such a way that we would only love him, there's nothing real or genuine about it. So God has to give man free will so that man out of his own decision-making process says, God, (laughs) I choose to tell you I love you and I want you, then he's able to say, ah, there is someone who has set their love upon me. We wouldn't know love for each other and we wouldn't know love for God because to know love God had to give us the option of hate. He had to allow choice. Beloved God so values genuine love that he was willing to risk man choosing evil. None of this fixes it entirely, does it? Okay, well, what about this? Can't God just wipe out people who choose evil and cause others to suffer? Can't God just get rid of the evil people? Does anyone know how crazy that is? When you say that, you've done at least a couple things. You've shown how self-righteous you are, and you've signed your own death warrant. (laughs) Because when we say, can't God just wipe out people who choose evil, you are saying, God, wipe me out. Because the scripture couldn't be clearer and we don't like this, but it's true. Paul says in Romans chapter three, verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. He goes on a few verses later in in chapter three, verse 23, and he says every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. We've all blown it, we've all fallen short to make us more uncomfortable, but I'm not putting it up on the screen because it would overload us. Ephesians chapter two, verse three says that by our very nature, by our very fallen nature, we are children of wrath. 
Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, that before we met Jesus, we were enemies of God. To say, can't God just wipe out the wicked is us being self-righteous and signing up for him to wipe us out. Okay, well, uh, uh, okay, well, here, here, okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. What about this? Can't God stop more of the evil and the suffering? Okay, here's where it came from, and I get my own fallenness and all that, but, but can't God just stop more of the evil and the suffering that we see? Well, beloved, first of all, we don't know how much he already stops. We don't know how much he already restrains. He is the restrainer. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, he is the restrainer. God is a restraining God. We don't know how much he already doesn't or does restrain. The other issue is, friends, where does God draw the line to appease men? Think about this, friends. We're, we're right now on the one-year anniversary of what happened, the mass murder of people in Las Vegas, Nevada. 58 people were gunned down in cold blood, total strangers of the shooter. No personal grievance, just a bloodlust for murder. 58 people were shot down. Would it have been all right with us if only 26 were shot down? Can't, can't God stop it? That guy shot into a group of thousands of people. And 58 people perished. Where do we draw the line where does God draw the line to say, oh, that much is acceptable, but this much isn't? Is it, is it okay if a if hundred of our young men die on the battlefield? But a thousand is too many? Ask the survivors of the 100 if 100 is an acceptable amount. Where does God draw the line to appease us? We don't know how much God already stops and restrains. The fact of the matter is, friends, one of any of these tragedies is too much. And it brings heartache. And it brings suffering. And in this fallen, broken world that we live in until Jesus comes back, suffering is gonna happen. What we need to do, and the best thing to do is prepare as much as you can before it knocks on your door. What we have to do is learn how to process and deal with suffering in a way that allows hope and healing from heaven to touch our hearts. I want you to think about some other things here. Kind of switching gears from the philosophical to the biblical. The word omniscience, omniscience. It means God's all-knowingness. It means God knows everything. We have to understand the role of the omniscience of God and how that plays into tragedy and suffering. God in his all-knowingness, in his omniscience, we don't like this, but it's true. He will allow temporary suffering 
in order to produce a greater eternal good. That in the present, I want you to hear me. It doesn't seem fair or make any sense. I almost entitled, in fact, I had typed in the, the title for this message was going to be Sense of Suffering. <laughs> you can't make sense of it. You can bring some answers. You can bring some ideas to it. But you can't make sense of it. I don't know that we ever get to the point where we see a horrific tragedy and make sense of it. God in his omniscience will allow temporary suffering to produce a greater eternal good in the future. But in the present, it doesn't seem fair or make any sense at all. The examples in the scripture are many. It's been argued for centuries that the oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. The, th the theme of the book of Job is suffering and restoration. Don't forget the restoration part. It is almost as if the first thing God is wanting to communicate to mankind in our fallen world is that suffering and restoration are gonna be part of our lives. And so the book of Job comes to us. Job loses, loses all of his sons, all of his daughters. Job loses his wealth and his health, and yet it led him to a deeper place in God. And then it ended up allowing him to be doubly blessed on earth as sons and daughters and wealth were all returned to him. God knew the good future outcome so he allowed the painful present. God in his omniscience will allow things to happen that don't make sense and don't seem fair, but it's going to produce the greater good for eternal sake. Hard but true. We've got more than the, the example of Job. We have the example of Joseph. Think about young Joseph, favored son, given the coat of many colors. He's sold into slavery only after one of his brothers came to his rescue while the others wanted to kill him. <laughs> you thought you had family problems. So he ended up being sold into slavery by his jealous brothers that hate him. He's separated from a father who loves him. He's taken to the foreign land of Egypt. While he's there, he's falsely accused of rape. He then gets thrown in prison He's then forgotten while he's in prison. And then once he gets remembered and ministers to Pharaoh himself by interpreting a dream, Joseph becomes the second in command in all of Egypt. He was then positioned to rescue his family of 70 from famine. And he watched those 70 become what we call today the nation of Israel. In Job's life, in Joseph's life, and in our lives, God knew the good outcome. So he allowed a painful present. Joseph seemed to understand this, and so when we get to the end of his story and the end of the book of Genesis, Joseph says to his brothers, after all has been forgiven, after all has been made up for, Joseph's commentary to his brothers is this, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. 
in order to bring it about as it is this day so that many people could be saved alive. I'm convinced the hardest verse in all of the Bible to believe is in the same spirit as Genesis 50, 20. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. We find the verse in the New Testament. We know it as Romans chapter eight, verse 28, where the apostle Paul says, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I believe that's the hardest verse in the Bible to believe. Pastor Steve, are you telling me that this tragedy, my tragedy, that tragedy, in that person's life who loves God, are you telling me that God is, is able to work that out for the good? You, you believe that Old Testament, old Bible story where Joseph said what you meant for evil against me, God was actually in the middle of that working it out for the good of an entire nation? You believe that? Man, <laughs> I do. And there's times it plagues me. There's times. <laughs> well, if I'm honest with you, nobody would come back next week, would you? There's times where it's hard because we feel the immediacy of the, of the present pain. And we can't see beyond it because it's so suffocating. It's so all-encompassing. God, how are you gonna turn this around for the good? How could any good come from this? All I feel is pain and sorrow and suffering and grief and loneliness and despair. I feel like you haven't come through for me. I feel forsaken, alone. Sick, hurting, despondent. I wish I could cry. I'm past tears. You're going to turn this around for my good? Watch it. Watch it. Faith plays a role in this. There's no question about it. It is by looking to the future. It is, it is by looking up even just a little bit over the horizon of our own limitations and our own pain. If we could just look a little higher if you can't find someone to come lift your head up for you. Just look a little farther, a little higher, and believe him. Trust him. Watch and see. Watch and see what he'll do.
for suffering to be turned into healing. You gotta choose to trust God and hang on to him just like Job did and just like Joseph did. There's one more that we have to talk about. Just say, you cry out there. You get to cry. You get to wipe your nose, nice, everything. I do it. I've got snot coming down in front of <laughs> hundreds of people. What about Jesus? Not just Job or Joseph. What about Jesus? We don't even know the depth of this first part of Jesus' suffering. I don't think we'll ever know, maybe even in heaven. But Jesus, who is eternal God, the great I am, lowered himself and he took on human flesh. He lowered himself from the throne of glory with all of his divinity and came and took on frail humanity. While he was here, he was tempted by Satan. His own family thought he was crazy. He was betrayed and forsaken and abandoned by his friends. He was falsely accused and given a mock trial by religious leaders. He was whipped and beaten and mocked. And maybe when there was hope that just one of his bros would stick by him. Someone would be there. Peter said, that Jesus means nothing to me. Suffering? You want to talk about suffering? He's then crucified by the Romans. God the Father then laid the sins of humanity on him. I can't bear my own, let alone yours or the whole world's. What is that like? He dies between two thieves. He's buried in a, bar in a borrowed grave. Jesus experienced every form of human, emotional, spiritual suffering somebody could ever experience. Was it fair? Was it right? Was it just? Was it deserved? No, 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 and no. And yet God, in his omniscience, allowed the temporary suffering to produce the greater good, in fact, the greatest good, the salvation of all of humanity who had received Christ's love that only came through the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross. Throughout Scripture, God in his omniscience allows a painful present to bring about a greater good. talk to you just a little bit more about Jesus and his suffering. Christ's suffering was about salvation for sure. But let me tell you what else it was about. It was about sympathy. This, this is even like more personal to me. Maybe it won't be for you. But I think we can look at Christ's suffering was, you know, the salvation of the world or the salvation for all of us or even the salvation of me or you individually, but there's something about the sympathy of Jesus that makes this real personal, close to me. Jesus' suffering was about salvation, but it was also about sympathy for you and I. I want you to read this famous verse, the book of Hebrews 4.15 says it like this. We don't have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. That's written in the negative. If we were to read it in the positive, we would say, 
Y'all, we've got a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Why? Because in every single way, he was tempted just like us. He knows what it's like to live in this world with its temptations and its brokenness. And he came in our form. He limited himself. He suffered himself so that he could look at us and go, yo, I get it. What a savior. I get it. I know what it's like to have the devil breathing down your neck. I know what it's like to have friends leave you. I know what it's like. Fill in the blank. And when all of us have combined all of our heartache, it will never eclipse what he personally experienced by himself. Therefore, we all can run to him and say, Jesus, we know you understand. We need sympathy. And we know that you know what we need because you went through what we go through. It's not just salvation. It's sympathy. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, look at this. Where it was fitting, it was right. It was fitting for Jesus for whom are all things and by whom are all things. In order to bring many sons to glory, look at this, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through his sufferings. It was right. It was fitting that Jesus have to suffer so that he then could become our perfect sympathizing savior. His suffering, his suffering is something that we've got to connect with and identify with in our own suffering and in our own grief. If we let the devil tell us Jesus can't relate because he's God high and lofty, remind him that the captain of our salvation became perfect through for us through his suffering. The shortest verse in the Bible. Anybody know it? John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. There at the tomb of Lazarus, when he sees the heartbreak and the suffering of the grieving, Jesus, our sympathizing, suffering Savior, enters into the grieving process of his friends and weeps with them. He doesn't show up and say, hey, y'all, it's going to be all right. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Come on, tomorrow's going to be a better day. God forbid that he cheapen our grief and our loss with such frivolity. Jesus entered into our pain and weeps. Jesus became perfect because of his suffering. And therefore, he offers us a perfect solution. He offers us himself. Jesus is perfect for us. Therefore, friends, the solution to our suffering isn't a program, it's a person. And his name is Jesus. We started this message this morning with the word why. 
the question, why? Why does God allow tragedy and suffering? So one more time, we're going to end with why. Jesus on the cross, in all of his humanity and in all of his suffering, says, my God, my God, why? He doesn't say, my God, once. He says, my God, my God, why? Why what? Why have you forsaken me? Jesus felt forsaken. Jesus asked why. Yeah. Yeah. There's a good chance at some point in your life you might feel and say the same thing. You can ask why. You can ask why. You just can't stay there. You can't stay there. You're never going to get an answer at this side of heaven that completely satisfies and speaks to you the horror of your particular suffering. You're going to get things that help you, but ultimately, it's going to be an act of faith for you to hold on to what you don't understand. And that's then what Jesus demonstrates for us in his final words. Because his final words aren't, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The last thing that he then said was, what? Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I don't get it. My God, my God, why? I feel forsaken. This isn't right. This isn't f fair. I don't deserve this. I, why would you leave me in my most desperate hour? My God, my God. But Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I don't understand. But I trust. All the way back to Job. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Well, let me just give you a, a little hope. <laughs> the Apostle Paul, who was a guy who was fully acquainted with suffering. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 18, he said, under the unction, the compelling of the Holy Spirit, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, that they are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He doesn't deny the suffering. He says it's real. But what I've realized about the reality of my suffering is that if I look again just over the horizon of my own pain, there is a glory it's waiting. It's got my name on it. Whew. And if I can just keep my eyes on that glory, this stuff right here 
It ain't worthy, Polly. It's not worthy to be compared to the glory we're going to get. Suffering, man, it's real. Anybody who tries to tell you it's not in the life of a believer, run. But the sufferings of this present world, it's not worthy to be compared to the glory that we're going to experience. Even so, come Lord Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. Amen. Well, we're going to take it the next wee bit here to sing a little bit and to pray a little bit. So, here's, here's the invitation. The invitation is this. Maybe you've been suffering and you've been afraid to talk about it. You've been afraid to let anybody know because what might they think? I'm supposed to be the head, not the tail. I'm, I'm never supposed to feel anything bad or never supposed to be sick and I'm just going to confess my way into, you know, every bit of victory and power all the time, every day. <laughs> yeah. I just want to invite you this morning to come to the table if you're suffering. I don't care what it is, y'all. I'm not going to ask. It's none of my business. But if you want to worship and pray in the midst of your personal suffering, you can make your way down to the altar. We'll do this with you. I'll do it with you. I'm here. You know somebody who's suffering. You want to intercede for them. You want to stand in the gap. You want to be their stretcher bearer and carry them to Jesus because they're too paralyzed, it seems like, to get there by themselves. And why don't you worship for them and pray for them who are suffering? Let's end by having church. Let's end by being the church. Come on.